Facebook Live is happening. <laughs> it's almost ready. And I am not sure if it's happening or not. Let's see. It is happening. Okay, it's now streaming live on Facebook. Yeah, beautiful. All right, I'm almost ready here. Just a few more technical things to. And I'm so glad we're doing this. People coming online. waving to each other that's always a nice thing Jennifer your volume went down a bit yeah I, I guess I wasn't speaking very loudly oh. is, it, is it better now yes okay good yes I and I left my my microphone in Vermont I'm at my brother's house so uh, and there's some static I don't know if it's on yours or on someone else's but yeah, there's a lot of it's static not mine my computer is uh well maybe i'll stop the recording um, and just let the live on facebook be the recording it's a little much for my computer so i think i'm gonna have to see if i can find the funds to get a new computer so let's see here All right. Well, I hope it'll my computer will calm down in a minute. Sorry for the static. And can you hear me okay? Does it sound all right now? Okay, great. So let's begin as we always do with a prayer and a blessing. So I'm going to invite you to place your hand on your heart. And let's be wholeheartedly grateful and thankful for this opportunity to gather together today and to remember the Christ, the Christ within. So grateful and so thankful to partner up with that higher Holy Spirit self and to allow ourselves this gathering of love, of like-minded souls from all over the world coming together to celebrate the Christ within and within each other. We are willing to see that Christ in our brothers and sisters, and for this we give thanks to ourselves, to our own willingness. We give thanks to Jesus for his walk on the earth and his continuing loving and nurturing of all humanity. We are grateful and thankful to all the angels, all the ascended masters, all the beautiful beings in our lives, who lift us, who walk with us, who talk with us, all the mighty companions, known and unknown, visible and invisible. We are grateful and thankful to join together for a healing and holy purpose here and now to remember our divinity and the divinity of all life. In celebration of the Christ, we say, and so it is, amen, amen, amen. Yes. All right. So I have no plan at all for us. I just thought, well, we're family. We're used to gathering together. We, many of us know each other very, very, very well. Some of us know each other better than we know anybody else, really, in a sense. And we are grateful just that we can come together. And uh, this year, I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many of you have been uh, alone for the day, home alone for the day, maybe? Yeah, quite a few people. So that was part of the, the impetus that Spirit gave me is now is a time for us to remember each other and to gather together. I feel very blessed because uh, being in Vermont, really living practically in isolation, hardly seeing anyone and 
barely going to the grocery store every other week kind of thing, I, I feel very um, held and protected by the mountains in the valley which I live and uh, not exposed to hardly anyone or anything. Uh, and my family has really been in lockdown since March for the most part, as have many of us. So uh, the younger ones who are out and about a bit more, they all got tested. And so we, we came together for Christmas, uh, really missing my dad, who I haven't seen in well over a year now, because we would have seen him for sure. I would have seen him in, in at Easter time. That was our plan. And then we would have seen him in the summertime. But now it's been... Um, about a year and four months since we've been together. That's way too long. And um, same with my nephew, my nephew Ben. I did get to see him in March because I went to California right before the lockdown. In fact, the day the lockdown started was the day I came back from California. So I'm really missing my oldest nephew Ben, that we didn't get to see him uh, in the summertime or Christmas time. I know many of you are really missing your loved ones. And uh, why don't we just put a little intention here. We've got the rest of the year. So it's December 25th. We've got less than a week. We've got six days left to the year. How would we, what would we like to rise up to in our hearts in the next six days? And Let's say we're going to leave 2020 behind in a wave of what? What is the primary thing for us? You can put things in the chat. And you can also, if you like, uh, raise your hand on the participants button on the bottom bar. If you click there, you'll see the raise hand button if you'd like to unmute and share. And what, what's most important to you to finish this year out? What is it you'd like to leave behind this year? I know many of you are going to be joining me in my New Year Reboot workshop, three-hour workshop on New Year's Eve, uh, which is Thursday. Um, but what's, what's important to you to leave in 2020, to not take with you? What's your focus for the rest of the year? I'm interested to know. So let's see, I'm going to read some of the things that people are sharing here. Uh, stay in the presence of love, no judgment. That's from Kathleen. Scott says total forgiveness. Tammy says love and gratefulness for 2020 showing us a new way. That's beautiful. Great to see you here, uh, Tammy. And Kelly says leaving unworthiness behind and know that the good of God is truly mine. Yes. Laurel says, be filled with the light of Christ and to see it in everyone and everything. Kathleen says, leave behind thinking I created anything bad in my life. Yes. Alyssa says, to remain peaceful. And Bernadette says, to let go of unworthiness. Heather says, leave judgment and replace with peace. Lawrence says, clearing out all the mind garbage. Lynn says, lights connecting even more. Harold says, leave the sorrow and pain for the loss of my brother. Yes, God bless your brother and you, Harold. Charlene says, anything negative. And I don't know what that symbol is. I probably somebody can explain that to me. I, I don't use those that much. I'm always curious. Um, Helen says, Jennifer, you've made me realize I no longer wish to play small. Thank you. Amen. Kathy says, study, I guess, chapter uh, 11, Christmas is the end of sacrifice. Carol says, forgiveness and gratitude, let go of grievances. Lori says, continue opening more to trust of all the good of God. Mary says, leave judgment, fear, and negativity. Charlene says, just a smile. Mary Lou, let go of grievances and Lori says, fabulous red on your lips, J.H. You know, I'll just tell you a little, little bit about my lipstick. Um, some of you know I've had a journey with lipstick in my life, a little bit. I talk about it from time to time. So, um, uh, most of my close, well, some of my close friends and my prayer partners 
that have been my prayer partners since the 90s, <clears throat> their hair has gone white. And so they look fabulous with red lipstick on. And my one of them, she started wearing this red lipstick that she copied from AOC, Alexandria or Ortez, uh, uh, what is it, Korea? I forget, I forget now, it's, I'm spacing on her name. But the congresswoman from New York. And um, apparently this, this, is, this is a pinker version of the red that she wears. So my friends started wearing the same lipstick. And so uh, when we would get together on our prayer Zooms, they were all wearing red lipstick but me. So I, I got some red lipstick in so I could be. And it suits me on a uh, Christmas day. Goes with my point setting. So thank you for noticing. And uh, full disclosure here, I'm letting my my little gray patches grow out. I had been coloring them because I didn't want to have two stripes. Yet. But I've just decided to be totally authentic. Doesn't matter to me anymore. Stripes, no stripes, whatever God's done, I'm sure it's fine with me. So, uh, yeah, that's happening. And, uh, <laughs> yes, and I got some red gra glasses for Christmas, too. So there you go. Um, thank you for all of that. And, uh, yes, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I hardly ever say her full name because we all say AOC. And I think we do it in part because that sounds cool. And uh, that's part one and part two is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a little bit of a mouthful. So uh, for maybe non-Latinos, and I'm definitely a non-Latina. And uh, though I do pretty well with pronunciation a lot of the time. So this year has pushed a lot of people to look at what they're just not interested in dragging with them anymore. What's important and what's not important. Uh, how many people have felt this year that their life was threatened? I'm just curious. How many people have felt that their life was threatened this year? Anybody? Because of the virus? Yeah, looks like a few people have felt that way. Yeah, and I think for people who have certain health issues already, that it feels that way. And certainly for um, in, in some ways, some people are feel more vulnerable than others, and uh, and that that actually, while it seems like it's a challenging, difficult thing that we don't like, it actually can help us, right? So that's the thing. Everything works together for our good, and no exceptions. So how about this? How about if on Christmas? We take Jesus at his word. Everything works together for good and there are no exceptions. Let's see if we can look at a few things that maybe this year, just maybe, we don't have a lot of time because we're just going to do an hour here. Um, what are some things that maybe we were labeling not good that we could be willing to see the good in? Now, first of all, of course, when someone passes away, that could seem not good. That can seem not good. But I think a lot of us have done some tiny, even a small amount of study or reading about people who experience near-death experiences. I've talked with uh, a bunch of people who've had near-death experiences. You know, they really, their body was pronounced dead and yet they were not uh, done. And so they, they seem to have left and come back, you know, going through the tunnel and all of that, traveling to the light and come back. And uh, one of the things that someone once told me, amazing story of his near-death experience, he said that it happened to him when he was a young man in his early 20s. And uh, he had a Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And he was in the hospital. And he was uh, just slipping away. He felt himself just very quickly slipping away. And so he was trying to do things like 
multiplication tables and things to keep his mind from going unconscious because he knew he was having a, 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 <laughs> he was dying. And um, when he he said he 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 sort of fell asleep into an experience where he was flying over the surface of a moonlit lake. That is this dark lake with this beautiful moon and then he realized oh no that's a light and I'm in a tunnel and he was flying towards the end of the tunnel and prior to this experience this actually this gentleman um, I wrote an article for Science of Mind magazine with him about about it and um, I interviewed him for that and he uh, he's actually Olivia Newton-John's husband I can't remember if they were married when we did the article, but I think they were together. It was a long time ago. But anyway, um, he said that he had been interested his whole young life, he was about 22 years old, in ancient treasures of the Mayans and the Incans and things like that. He had been so obsessed with it. His dream when he got out of college, because he was still finishing up college, was he wanted to go to South America and he wanted to be an explorer and he wanted to go through the jungles and find lost civilizations and things like that. He had so many questions about these lost civilizations and these pyramids and things in South America. And he said as soon as he was in that tunnel traveling to the light, he knew everything, the answer to every question he'd ever had. He knew, he knew everything about everything. And he said that in that experience of the near-death experience, the two most important things that he learned from that experience were there's only two things that matter, love and forgiveness. Love and forgiveness. And that is surely the teaching of A Course in Miracles. Love and forgiveness. This is all that matters. Forgiving so that we can express more love, so we can receive more love, be more loving, share more love, shine more love. And the only thing that stands in the way is what we might call unforgiveness. And so when he, when he survived that experience, he said, I made up my mind that after college I was going to sell my car, take that money, buy a plane ticket, and go to South America. I think he went to Brazil first. And so that's what he did. He did that and he started exploring and exploring and exploring. And he loved it. He just absolutely loved it. And um, he said to me one of the most amazing things after that experience of the near-death experience was he said when I came back I had no fear because I knew the worst thing that could happen to me was that I would die to this human experience and when I was actually legally dead it was fabulous it was like I didn't want to come back but I wasn't done I had things to do so I've heard other people say that as well. Say it personally to me. I didn't want to come back, but I wasn't done, so I had to come back. And But they, they were like, I was so willing to let everything go and not come back. Because it was so heavenly. that The energetic of how it felt was so magnificent and so beautiful. And so that's a very common thing for people who have a near-death experience is they realize there's nothing to be afraid of. In death. There's nothing to be afraid of in death. Even if you feel incomplete, there's nothing to be afraid of. Even if you haven't done your bucket list, there's nothing to be afraid of. Even if you didn't tell those people that you loved them when you had the opportunity, there's nothing to be afraid of. Even if you were mean and, and, and contrary to people, there's nothing to be afraid of. We don't have to be afraid of anything. So that's one thing I, I, I feel that is the message that's coming through for today is how would you live your life if you had no fear whatsoever, right? Would you, how would you dance if nobody was watching and you weren't concerned that you didn't look good or you looked goofy or something like that? We can really learn to live that way. 
we can really learn to live that way. Just follow our heart, follow our bliss, follow our passion. And it does take a tremendous amount of willingness. A tremendous amount of willingness. So I would ask you to contemplate here for a moment. If you could just choose two things, two things that you would do if you had no fear. Two things that you would do if you had no fear. And one of them might be, would you tell somebody how you really feel? Would you tell somebody how you really feel? And, uh, you know, um, telling somebody how you really feel is not telling them you're angry at them, you're mad at them, that you're hurt, because then you haven't taken responsibility for how you feel. Why, why would you want to tell somebody how you feel if you're mad at them? You haven't taken responsibility. It's not, it's not really worth it. It's not really worth it at all. We need to do some inner work before we do that. I know it's not a popular... Uh, view, but it is my view. If I'm really pissed off at somebody, I, I don't have to tell them. That's for me to talk with God about. It. So so I'm curious. People can uh, raise their hand, even wave if you'd like to share. Love to hear some, from some other people. Okay, Lynn. You're the first hand I saw. Hi, family. Happy birthday. <laughs> Jennifer, it's so good to be here. Yes. If I didn't have any fear, I've been writing poetry for six decades, and um, and it's pretty good poetry. <laughs> and I would uh, I would attempt to get it out into the world more. I read every time I go to John Mondays. I read a poem, um, but that's what I would do. Definitely. Definitely. It's all in dated order. Six decades, all in dated order. And um, I would, it's it's really revelant what's going on now. And, and it seems with fear, I'm around 180 degrees. When I was younger, I didn't have any fear. I But I was also naive. So I suffered the consequences. I'm not naive anymore. And now I don't have fear, and um, you know, I just open myself to being led. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Yes, your poetry is beautiful. Your poetry is beautiful. Just John publishes uh, the magazine. The only places that it was published uh, is with the American Poetry Society, where I paid for the books. Although on uh, one of the books, they put my poem on the first page. So that was good. John Monday sometimes publishes my poetry in his uh, Miracles magazine or on course before that. And, but I'm thinking maybe a blog. I, I don't know what to do, you know? So that's something that I'm going to concentrate on this year. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I would publish one in one of my blogs. Yeah, send me one. I'd be happy to. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Excellent. And there's nothing I can do about the background noise. It's just my, the fan inside my computer is working hard because of the Facebook Live. That's why working just a little too hard but I'm hoping the microphone is a little better thank you yeah let's see who else oh J uh, Scott go ahead and then Lorraine yeah um first of all when I, I've had the pleasure of hearing your poetry as well and it, it was beautiful when when I came down to the uh, CRS Center with John Monday um last February um and so beautiful um I have something very similar. If uh, if I wasn't afraid, I would share my music more uh, and perform more. Um, that would so I could really relate to that. Um, and um, the second thing would be um, like like to ask women out more. And both is like a fear of rejection or something. 
behind both of those things, I think. Um, but um, I'm, uh, yeah, I've, I've been sharing my music more and I want to do it even more. Sorry, I had myself muted just to uh, try and see if I could deal with the sound better. That's great, Scott. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Lorraine. Hi, nice to see you all. <laughs> um, you, did you know that I read someplace that the definition of enlightenment is to live without fear? So, um, and so that's a very deep kind of inquiry. And I think for me, I, if I was, um, if I didn't have fear, I would be more present. I would be far more open-hearted. I would be very loving all the time. And I would enjoy, I would enjoy every moment, I'm sure. So thanks. That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. All right, anybody else like to share? What would you do? What would you consider shifting, changing? A couple of things if you had no fear, Heather? Um, well, the thank you for the other author sh sharing. I, I too, um, one of my biggest fears is sharing uh, my journey, even though I think it could help a lot of people. So that's like one of my ambitions. And then also um, the traveling around the world. I've never been anywhere besides uh, the United States. So. That's great, yes. It's, see, I find that it is so, so helpful for us to actually just state it out loud, especially in front of other people. It helps take the stigma off it. Oh, look who wants to join here. Can you see here? Who else? That's Bella. Mark. Hi, I've written a book that I've been working on for 30 plus years and I had it edited to the point where I think it's probably ready to publish. I want to put it online and if I could move myself back, it would be there so people can look at it and see if they like it. Yeah. Have you, are you in a book group, a writing group rather? I was for a while, but when I moved to San Diego, there isn't a, I haven't been. I joined one recently, the Publishers and Writers of San Diego, and I'm hoping to make some headway with them. But this COVID thing is, I was in a coma for 25 days from coma back, COVID back in March, and I did not have your typical near-death experience. I was just in blackness for that whole time. I had no idea the time was gone until I came back. So I'm still in recovery, but I'm here. I'm unstoppable. What's to keep me from getting published? That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. And you know, uh, when I first moved to Maine from uh, New York back in 1990, one of the first things I did was I started a writer's group. And um, I put an ad in the local paper and I talked with people. Some people were a fit, some people weren't a fit. And I started that group. And now you can start a group on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to do that. And, and uh, maybe you can get a, a group out of us here, you know, even because writers need other people to sound off of and listen to their to to their work so good for you for moving forward absolutely beautiful 
who else is raising their hand here? Like to share something that you've been afraid to do that maybe you could just acknowledge if you had the courage, what is something you would do? Because then you can ask spirit to give you the courage, right? It works. Believe me, I know this. Yeah. Let's see what's in the chat here. Oh, Kelly. Go ahead, Kelly. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Happy Boxing Day from Australia. We're wrapping our presents for the peasants right now. <laughs> I would wrap, uh, um, I would love people. I think that my fear is loving people. I ask the Holy Spirit to uh, help me release that fear of love. Thank you. I think a lot of people feel that way. We'd love more fully. Can you see here, Bella is reaching out to me. She's like, see, I, I, she's, I, will you pet me? I'm here. I'm here. Nope, oh, there she goes. <laughs> That's beautiful, Callie. I believe we can love people whether they like it or not. Yeah, to me, the only gift that we can take with us out of this life is the love. It's like the, the Beatles said, and in the end, right? It's the love that you make. That's it. <sighs> Let's see. See. Thank you, Yvonne. Yes, so sweet. Robin. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, and just speaking of love is the answer. And I'm more than willing to stop that voice that says I'm not good enough to be loved and to really open my heart to noticing when I'm not loving towards myself and letting that go. And, and really that's my, um, after all these years, I feel like I'm on the cusp um, of really wanting that experience and living from that truthful place that no matter what I've done or no what matter what mistakes uh, I keep making or um, that I am, my true self is whole and is loving and um, always desires to just to extend love, um, but finding that challenge and uh, just being afraid to be noticed in the world. Uh, and I, I don't want, I want to be noticed in that, in that way that I am here to serve the light. So thank you, Jennifer, for this. <laughs> I think we serve the light just by gathering. Thank you, Robin. Just by gathering, we serve the light to come together for the holy purpose of remembering our true identity and recognizing that we can be the love, we can witness other people, we can be witnessed in loving, compassionate ways. It's so powerful, so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Lori. You know, when you ask that, that question about what would you do if you weren't, if you didn't have fear? I had this thought of not feeling as much fear anymore as when I started in massive living. And then what piggybacked on that thought was, and because of that, Lori, you haven't been as angry. Like so much of my, I have lived so much of my life being so angry at the world and so angry at people and and being so controlling and so I had to plan everything out and I had to be contrary and 
And that has completely shifted. And this morning I was given the biggest gift and I, it was the simplest thing, but it, it's similar to Carolyn, what Carolyn was sharing. My sister-in-law reached out to me just spontaneously and because I had expressed I would love to do a Zoom call with the family sometime. And we were on Zoom for 90 minutes and we all lost track of time. And I talked to, everyone took a turn passing the phone around and we, it wasn't just simple conversation. It was just this heartfelt, loving time that we spent together and I, we got up and I felt so much joy. I was like, oh, my Christmas is complete in this moment. And that has never happened before. So I know that the next step for me, the biggest fear I have is being in an intimate relationship. However, I know that going back around to what I first said was, Fear for me is intricately tied into the anger that I've used to protect me all my life. So thank you. Thank you for hosting this today, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Lori. I know how much that means to you. And as it would mean so much to any of us to see that kind of shifting, that loving acceptance, that tremendous transformation in our family. And I, I can piggyback on that myself because I woke up thinking about that too. I'm in New Jersey, very close to Manhattan, can see Manhattan skyline from just two blocks away. And um, it was very windy and stormy and rainy last night. Very, very windy. And I'm uh, in the third story of a three-story house, so I could really feel and sense the wind. And uh, Native Americans teach us that that wind, when it's fierce wind like that, it really comes from people's stirred up emotions impacting the environment, impacting the electrons, impacting the, the molecules and, and the elementals. And uh, it's just an expression of our own upset. And, uh, you know, a lot of people in New York City and New Jersey, uh, a lot of families lost, lost loved ones this year. A lot, a lot, huge death toll, huge, very, very impactful. And a lot of people lost their loved ones in the form of friends who left the city or left the area, moved away looking for uh, a, a safer space, or they couldn't afford their uh, homes anymore because they weren't working, so they had to move in with families and things like that. So lots of stuff happening in the world, and the meaning people make of it is deeply, deeply upsetting. And so I think that was part of that intense wind last night. And uh, the, all the energetics had me up till about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was wrapping presents, and then I was praying and just being still and meditating. Um, and I knew I'd wake up refreshed because I was in my spiritual practice and not sleep-deprived. But uh, when I woke up this morning, I had uh, a sense of times in many years past when I would wake up on Christmas morning and be a bit fearful of being disappointed for Christmas Day that uh, somebody would say something or do something, there would be fighting, there would be um, disappointments and, and hurts and wounds poked at and feeling anxious and apprehensive. Um, and I'm so glad that I really I don't experience it like that anymore. And, and I was also contemplating how, uh, and I've talked about this many times, I really feel like when I changed my whole dynamic of my entire family changed, including my parents' relationship with each other, my brother's relationship with his wife, everybody's relationships in the family changed when I changed my view of them. And so this is why 
to all we need for divine vision and peace and joy and prosperity is to take full responsibility for what we see and what we feel. And uh, I felt that so strongly this morning and so grateful that I, I found the spiritual teaching that guided me to that and I was willing to do that. You know, it didn't happen for me over the weekend. It took me years, but I really have come to that place of understanding the value of forgiveness and responsibility. It's un unbelievable how much benefit those two things bring. Yeah. And so many of you, I know you've seen it demonstrated in your own families, in your own lives, in ways that are just breathtaking and magnificent. Yeah. Somebody else like to share? Oh, hey, Suzanne. Nice to see you. Yay. Anybody else have a thought or a feeling to share? Yeah, Joanne. Um, just on that, what you're sharing now, um, I just would love to let you know that I did get to see my son and daughters, my granddaughters. And it was all very lovely and it was like we you know, saw each other yesterday. <laughs> it, was, it was really good. It was really just quite relaxed. Oh, this yeah. is that wonderful. Yeah, so just through what you're saying, through, you know, how when we change, it does happen. And I even noticed yesterday with my eldest daughter, uh, who I don't, uh, with my youngest girl, I could talk all about the spirituality and what I'm doing now, but not not with my oldest girl so much. But they're deeply into gratitude now. It's, it's become a huge part of her and her husband and their little three-year-old boy. It's just become a major part of their life. And just through you sharing what you've said now, I just thought, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, and so what? How do you think that change came about for them that they started practicing gratitude like that? Uh, well, when Laura would have conversations with me, particularly about work or if her and her husband had had a conflict, I would eventually get around to gratitude, um, which she'd sort of go, "Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, that again." <laughs> but I think, uh, particularly her husband. Um, was using gratitude because he was starting a new career and um, taking a big cutting pay to change career and, and he was he just seemed to go that path of gratitude and the three of them now are just doing that all the time even little Harry talks that way <laughs> it's just really great ah yeah. that's so I, yeah yeah, when we rise up in gratitude, we naturally magnetize to us more and more good. Lynn, and thank you for that, Joanne. So glad to know that for your family. Forgiveness opens the door to mind-blowing stuff. I um, facilitate a spirituality group at NAMI. I always tell my group, if you could forgive someone for being an idiot, you could forgive yourself for being an idiot. It's, um, yeah, we, we hurt just like people hurt us. And holding resent, someone asked about uh, under being not able to forgive and it's the resentment. And, and uh, it's, it's like gratitude. Gratitude is a wonderful place to live. That meant it's not a good place to live. Love is the best place to live. And so many, we're all realizing this now. This is our birthday, the birth of Christ. We're recognizing love. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for you, Jennifer. Oh. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> yes, that's an important point, you know. Um, if, if someone's an idiot, don't we all have to be idiots if we're all one? So uh, for me, it was a wonderful teaching to realize sometimes I act like an idiot, but that doesn't make me an idiot. 
right? Sometimes I act in an irresponsible way, but that doesn't make me a bad person. It's, let's, let's not label people, we can just look at the behavior. Thank you for that, Lynn. And Suzanne. Let's see, let me get you. Oh, there. I'm unmuted. Okay. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. And I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful uh, just for everything. You know, throughout this pandemic, I really find myself um, in a good position. You know, I have a job, I'm working from home. Um, the isolation doesn't bother me at all. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it didn't because in the past I had the opportunity to work from home. And I said, no, no, I, I like going to the office. I like to be around people. Well, I'm finding I like just taking five steps from the couch over to the chair and, I, and I'm at work, you know? So um, I have so much to be grateful for, uh, you know, compared to what so many other people are experiencing. And, um, uh, sometimes I think if I if I didn't have fear, I might just pick up and move to a different state. I'm not sure where that would, you know, start a new life, but I feel like I'm, you know, too old to do that. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm contemplating like, can I re afford to retire now or do I need to work a few more years, that sort of thing. And I've always, you know, I'm a California native, never thought I would ever leave the state, but you know, things, it's just, it's tough all over. And, and I guess it's my fantasy to just find some little peaceful place and, you know, get a bunch of animals and hang out, you know? So anyway, I'm just really glad to be here to see all of you. And thank you for doing this today. Yeah. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah. And you know, for me, I, I know, you know, this is saying, mm -hmm. I, I pray for the highest and best all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, what do we care where we go or what we're doing? If it's the highest and best, who cares? Right. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's thank beautiful. You. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So happy you're thriving. Thank you. Oops. Patricia. I want to, I want to say, first of all, that I really appreciate your daily prayers. Mm. I don't know what I would do without them. Um, it's my pleasure. And as far as what I would do without fear in my life, if I didn't fear, first of all, I don't like to acknowledge that that's what's stopping me. Mm. You know? But that said, I feel alive, most alive when I sing. And I'm feeling that slowly dying, my voice is slowly dying because I'm not, I'm not using it. So that is the one, one big thing that I would do. And, and it's not just singing either. It's, it's something that I looked into years ago and haven't moved forward on. I got as far as getting a studio set up in a closet and never got into the closet to get out of the closet, so to speak, uh, for doing voiceover work. And because I love making words come to life. And, but what, what, what stops me all the time is, yeah, and you know, what kind of contribution is that? I have all these, judgments hmm. I, I don't know if the judgments get more in the way or the fear and so i do know that i'm stopped i stop myself every time i turn around so. well i find that most of the time when we're stopped like that it's because we're judging ourselves we're pre-judging ourselves you know how we get those things in the mail that say jennifer you're pre-approved <laughs> that when we're resistant and reluctant a lot of the time it's we're pre-judging ourselves rather than pre-approving ourselves <laughs> and so um what i've learned as a great tool is simply to say holy spirit whatever this block is I, I don't need to understand it. I just do not wish to experience it anymore. 
I'm choosing freedom. I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. And the other thing is, a lot of these people can testify doing the self-forgiveness work. You know, it, it's not for the faint of heart. It, it's challenging, right? I mean, those of you who've been doing it, has it been challenging to do the self-forgiveness work? Yeah, you see people waving their hands. Is it worth it, though? Is it worth going through the challenge? Okay, yeah, exactly. So that's the thing. And so to me, that's where, for me, I realized it's a matter of self-care. Self-care. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's why Spirit had me talk about um, what would you do if you had no fear. Because I, I had no, I mean, I don't care what we talk about. Why would I care? You know, really, I just i am happy just to be with you all. So it doesn't matter what we talk about. But I see the opportunity. Shauna. And thank you, Patricia. That was great. Everybody, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Uh, thanks, for Jennifer, for gathering us. I'm sorry I was late. I was actually, I'm going to say gratitude and then fear. Um, I was on a, a Zoom call with my family and my 99-year-old grandmother, and I'm just so filled with joy just hearing her voice and how, how alive she is. I'm so grateful. And um, one of the things I talked to you, we talked about Jennifer at the beginning of the year was I wanted to release some um, resentment towards my mother. And I really, I'm, I feel like I have a little more work to do, but on this call, I feel like, wow, I feel like I'm letting it go a little bit. Like, she, she, yeah, she, she's, her, she's trying her best and I'm so grateful to have her. She's not the mother I probably would have drawn up if, you know, if I, we're going to try to draw up a stereotypical, you know, very soft mother, but I'm blessed to have her. And I just, I just on this call, the Zoom call, I just kind of really felt it for, for the first time in a long time. So thank you for helping me get there. And then fear, I think I would just hide less. If I had no fear, I would hide less in both my personal life in terms of what I'd especially in terms of what what I want to express sometimes that I sometimes suppress both in terms of taste taking risks in love in expressing love and taking risks in expressing um anything that feels like conflict um and, and just being honest but I'm where I'm getting better and then the other thing is just creative expression like if I had no fear I would hide less my creative my creativity and um, I'm working on that. Yay, yay, yes. We are meant to be creative. It's so fulfilling. And you know, we can prime the pump with what I get from spirit right now is we can prime the pump in just really simple ways, like uh, taking pictures you know, or with our cameras on our phones and get creative with that. We can get creative in so simple ways. Like I, I like to do uh, cooking as a way of being creative and decorating in simple ways. We don't have to create something that we would um, put in a museum or anything like that. We can just express creativity with writing a sweet little poem in somebody's birthday card, all the millions of ways we can just keep that pump primed. Yeah, so we, we don't, as Patricia was referring to, we don't want to die with our music in us, right? So, I mean, in, in a very real way, sometimes people will say, you know, I, I'm just not sure what God wants for me. And I'm like, God does not want anything for you. This world is about what would you like for you? What would you like? This is an illusion. It doesn't, God is not wanting you to do something or not do something. It's not like that. It's really what is the expression of your heart, your expressions of love, self-forgiveness, accepting the atonement, accepting that there is no separation. That's all that matters in this world. It really, whether or not we lose weight and keep it off, whether or not we quit smoking, all these things, they don't really matter. What matters is, are we loving ourselves regardless? Are we loving the people around us regardless? 
I'll say very briefly, and I'm so glad to hear from you, Shauna. I had been wondering about your mom. I didn't get to ask you last time, but we talked. But um, I had an experience. I, I'm not going to tell the story, but I had an experience once with my mom when she was sick uh, towards the end of her life where I realized that I had missed the opportunity to be loving with her, to be kind, uh, and that I had I'd rushed her and uh, I could have been more helpful and I was in my own little world and I had missed the opportunity to really make the moment special and beautiful and loving. I missed that moment. And I'm glad for it now because at the time when I realized in the midst of it, ah, I missed this opportunity here to really be present with my mother. And I don't know how many I'll have left. That made me decide, I don't want to do that with anybody. I don't want to do that with anybody. But that's what this life is about. It's about having loving experiences with people. And the loving experience could be with a guy who's dropping off the packages from UPS. You can have a loving experience with that guy, you know. Uh, it, it, it could be the person that's bagging your groceries. It can be, I mean, we know all this. It's just like I, I've learned to love to say to people on the phone, you know, when you're, you've been on hold for 30 minutes with the bank and your personality is thinking, ah, I don't like this, right? Then the person comes on the phone and says, let me look that up for you. Just, it's going to take a minute here. I love to be able to say to them, take your time. Take your time. Because, you know, my old way would have been, what do you mean it's going to take a few minutes? I, I, do, you, do you have a clock there? Can you see how long I have been on hold here waiting for you to come? And now you're going to tell me it's going to take a few minutes just to answer that simple question? Like, what are you people doing over there? I used to be like that. So now I'm so happy that I can just say, take your time. Well, thank you for your patience. It doesn't require any patience. I'm happy. I'm happy. You know, I think of, whenever I say that, I kind of think of, there's a scene in um, the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, um, where he's leaving, right? He's leaving, he's started to climb down the tree, and she says, wait! And he comes right back, and he says, what, my love? And she says, oh, I have forgotten why I did call thee back. And he says, let me wait. I'm happy to sit and wait and to be with you until you remember. And she says, well, I'm so happy to be with you. I would have you stand there just to be with you while I try to remember. And he says, I'm totally fine with that. You know, and, and we can learn to live in a more loving way like that. That uh, it doesn't require patience. We can just say, you're my brother, you're my sister. Let me wait with you a moment. It's fine. It's fine. So, and that's the gift we give to ourselves. So I, I'm speaking to myself here, for sure. And uh, in those moments of waiting, instead of being annoyed and frustrated that it should be different, we can just remember the Christ, right? We can remember the Christ within us. And then what I have found every time is that Spirit provides whatever I need. If I need more time, I will get more time. Because time is no thing. There is no limitation in time. It just looks that way from our perspective. You know, there are certain things like, it looks like it's really far away sometimes on the horizon, but it's not. It's really quite close. That's how time is. It's very bendy. Very bendy. Much more bendy than we realize. So, and we're eternal beings, so how could we ever not have enough time? It's just an illusion. Well, I'm going to wrap this up with a prayer, and uh, uh, Sunday, we're going to gather on Sunday, and we'll have some music, and I'll give a talk, we'll see what Spirit has to say on Sunday, and then on New Year's Eve, I've got my epic three-hour New Year reboot workshop, you can find it at jenniferhadley.com, and, uh, and this year, coming. 
We're not going to take any prisoners this year. We are going to throw it down. We are going to work on a spiritual level unlike we've ever worked before. I'm just telling you, it is coming. It is coming. And I'm very excited for it. I'm just, I can feel what a wonderful year it's going to be for those who are interested in having a wonderful year of love and light. And so I'm so glad to spend this time with you on Christmas my brothers and sisters. So, wholeheartedly, we partner up with that higher Holy Spirit self. We're truly grateful and truly thankful for the Christ within, that it's pre-installed and we are pre-approved to express it, to share it, to be it, to acknowledge it, to shine it. We are grateful and thankful that regardless of whatever has experienced in the past, we are still free. We are still the light of the world. We are still brilliant and we are still beautiful. We are grateful and thankful to accept all the gifts of God that are ours to receive and to share the benefits with everyone. We bless all our brothers and sisters and we speak this word of prayer of blessing for everyone who feels left out or deprived or lost or grieving in any way, not at peace. We know the truth for them, and we are grateful and thankful to be part of this dynamic intelligence setting all of us free of lack, attack, limitation, and separation. In gratitude, we let it be. We know it's done, and so it is. Amen, amen, amen. And I love you. God bless you. Merry Christmas.